So today, uh, or rather this afternoon, I want to tell you about a technique call, that uh, we call evolving sets and uh, in, with a different goal it originates in a paper that Percy wrote with Jim Phil in 1990 under the name Strong Stationary Duality, but uh, I will use the name evolving sets. And uh, this, was, this is a process that um, Ben Morris reinvented in the, around 2000, and we uh, investigated it together for the purpose of getting good bounds on mixing times. And I'll say something about those bounds, but I want to have say, say in reverse order, after I started at, uh, at Microsoft Research, one of the questions that people were interested in there was uh, given a huge graph, maybe 300 billion nodes, um, I have, um, I have a one node I care about and I want to find the community of that node. So maybe this is, uh, you know, maybe this is some graph of the internet with links and I want to find the community of that node of size, say, 5,000. <laughs> How do I find such a community where the amount of work I want to do is, I want it to be proportional to the 5,000 and not to the 300 billion? So, can't quite do that, but we can get pretty close. Now, if the goal is to, for any network to find some optimal good neighborhood around it, that's impossible. That's, uh, but we want to find an approximation. And I'll tell you more about this problem in a minute. So, First, what you're seeing in the percolation is the process, what you're seeing in the picture is the process we use to find this approximation. This is the uh, version of the evolving set process. You start at a node and you have a set that's randomly changing. It's sometimes growing, sometimes shrinking. It's constrained to eventually, it's conditioned to eventually um, reach the whole space. Now in this simulation, I'm, not, I'm showing just a few thousand nodes so we can see what's going on. And this is a random geometric graph. But in applications, we're interested in much bigger graphs than we can ever look at in, in one picture. Um, so I'll come back to say what this does later. So let me stop this. And OK. So I want to, describe it to you from this perspective. Again, the way I arrived at it is first from the Markov chain application and then at this kind of uh, finding sparse cuts application, but I'll tell it now in the other order. So, so again, this is an applied problem. So there are various applications where we want to do uh, such a thing, various real world graphs where we want to do this kind of, uh, find this kind of community. So how do we measure our success? We're going to look at the, given any set, the volume is just the total stationary distribution of the set. So the sum of the degrees, if we're doing simple random walk on a graph. And, uh, and the conductance, this is not electrical conductance. This is the number of edges from S to its complement normalized by the volume. So that's phi of S. And so the goal is to find sets S of maybe a prescribed size that have a good boundary to volume or a small boundary to volume ratio. So that would be a local partitioning algorithm. So rather than take the whole huge graph and partitioning it to small set, we just want to find a good neighborhood of a given node with a small boundary. Okay. So, so it's different from a global algorithm because a global algorithm has to examine the whole graph. Here we are hoping just to examine a small neighborhood of the given node. And um, so we have some, so how are we going to measure the performance of the algorithm? We have some target conductance phi and we can change, we can search for different targets, but um, that, Suppose that the graph has a good cut with some conductance phi. We have no hope in general of finding the optimal cut. 
but we want to approximate it so uh, to find some some cut which approximate with conductance not too much larger than phi and uh, without doing too much work so the number of steps of the algorithm should be um, controlled in terms of the volume of the set S that we find. I want this ratio not to be too large. So maybe I'll, so we want some approximation guarantee if the real conductance is phi, we want to find a set with conductance at most f of phi. So f is a function that tells how much worse we're doing than the optimum. And there have been a lot of work historically on this, but I'm going to uh, skip most of the history and just say that the people who introduced this as a theoretical topic were Spielman and Teng. And because when you look at this type of problem, if I, when I first heard of the problem, it sounded, well, it's the kind of problem you might do heuristics for, you might run a random walk from the starting point, look at where you reach after a short time, and that should be a pretty good set but how are you ever going to prove a theorem about how this performs on a general graph? And the surprising thing is Spielman Teng did prove that with such an algorithm that just runs a random walk for a short time um, and then stops, look at the set that you visit, they proved some guarantee on how well this performs, which is very, was very surprising to me that it's possible. But then inspired by this, other people developed uh, variants and it's still true that the best algorithms we have are based on the evolving set algorithm that uh, we've uh, developed, although um, this, the analysis of the algorithm has been improved uh, by Luca Trevisan and Shayan Oves Garan. So, so what is this process we're looking at? So it's, it's a set-valued process, sequence of sets, um, and the size of the sets, as we'll see, the volume of the sets will be a martingale, and sometimes we'll want to condition this martingale not to vanish. So we'll have also a, uh, the volume biased version of this will be conditioned not to vanish. And as I mentioned, this first emerging work of Percy and Jim Phil with completely different terminology. So our basic object, we have a graph, our basic object will be a lazy random walk on the graph. So this is, these are the transitions for the walk. <laughs> and again, a natural thing to look at a good neighborhood of a set might be where you can reach in a small number of steps by the walk. However, we'll be able to do better using this evolving set process. And so what are the rules for so this is a set-valued Markov chain. Given that the current set is S, we're going to add and sub remove some vertices. And um, so every vertex is going to be added with the probability that a lazy random walk from that vertex jumps into S. So if you look here, suppose S is now the current set. The vertex A has two neighbors in the set, two out. So the chance that a random walk from A, a lazy random walk step, will jump into S, S is one quarter because it's lazy. So that's the chance that A will be added to S. Similarly, for B, the chance is 3 eighths. Now C, uh, with probability 2 eighths, it will jump out of the set S. With probability half, it will stay where it is. And probability 2 eighths will jump somewhere else in S. So the probability C will stay in S after one step of a lazy walk is 6 eighths. So these are the probabilities. But how do we actually determine whether A, B, C are in S? We're not going to run independent lazy walks from them. We're going to pick one uniform variable and make a couple decisions. So we'll, after we compute these probabilities, we pick a uniform variable and in 0, 1. And any vertex A where the threshold, so if, P, if this variable falls below, below 2 eighths, then we add. Um, a to the set S. This happens exactly with the right probability. Okay, so, <laughs> so formally, for every vertex, if we are now at S0, for every vertex Y, we calculate this P of Y S0, the probability that one step of the chain will bring it into S0. We pick a uniform variable and define S1 to be the vertices Y so that this happens. Okay. So is this, 
is clear. This is a set valued Markov chain defined based on the original chain. Uh, the reason it's useful, well, there are several, but one is that it's tightly linked to the original walk. And second, this volume of the set is a martingale, and we have a lot of good tools for analyzing martingales. Uh, so note that for the set valued chain, the empty set and the whole space are absorbing states. If, if you're in one of these, you're not going to move. Okay, so here is one fact I already mentioned, the, the expected volume, so the volume of ST is a martingale. Given that I know ST now, the expected volume in one step is the same as the current volume. And this is an easy calculation, maybe I'll have explained it in a, in a little while, but let me emphasize a closely related point, which is the connection to the random walk. The probability starting at x, the probability that y is in the set s at time t, is essentially the same as the transition probability for our lazy walk in t steps from x to y, except for a normalization factor, which is uh, this ratio of degrees. So the way we'll use it, although the evolving set looks like a more complicated object than the random walk, in fact, the way we'll use it is we will use the left-hand side to estimate the right-hand side. Um, so let's see, I want to say something. Okay, now, because this process is a martingale, I'll, I'll, I'll explain some of this. Uh, later, for this process of martingale, if we s we're going to start it at a single ton, it's very likely just to disappear and get absorbed in the empty set very soon, and then it's not going to be useful to us. So we want to condition it to get absorbed in the whole space rather than in the empty set. Mm. Now, this type of conditioning is well known in probability. It's known as a dub H transform. If you have a Markov chain that can be absorbed in several states. If you condition it to be absorbed in one state, this is a new Markov chain. And we know how to modify the transition probabilities from the old chain to the new chain. Uh, in the special case, it has a very nice representation. <laughs> and this representation was found, again, with different terminology by Dicomis and Phil. So let me tell you how this goes. We use this when we actually simulate the chain, or to be more precise, when my co-author Reed actually simulates the chain. Uh, so, so what is this process? So, it's going to, so we start with the set being at the x0 and the particle being in x0. You first update the random. So we're going to run a coupled process, both the evolving set and the particle are going to move. First, a particle moves according to the lazy random walk. So this is, so it started at x0. First it moved, so if it's at x, it's going to move one step to x prime, just according to the transition probability. So it ignores the, the set, it just makes a step as it's supposed to, according to transition. Now we're going to move the set by the evolving set rule, but conditioned to contain the moving particle. So so of course it's natural. If we want to, the set to not disappear, one way to do that is condition it to contain a specific point. Now you might first guess I want to just make it contain the starting point, but that turns out to be not the right thing to do. You want to condition it to contain a moving particle, and that turns out to have all the nice properties. And this was the coupling in, in, uh, in Dacon's fill. So, so what's the rule? If ST is S, we want to condition st plus 1 to contain the moving particle. Now we already know where the moving particle is, so this conditioning can be simulated very simply. The threshold u, instead of being uniform in 0, 1, it's going to be uniform in 0 and px prime s. This is the parameter that ensures that this point x prime is not lost. But this is very easy to implement. It's instead of uniform in 0, 1, it's going to be uniform in a smaller interval. And then we pick st plus 1 is just this new set with this new threshold, but u, instead of being picked in 0, 1, it's picked in the smallest interval, smaller interval, which ensures that the set doesn't disappear. In fact, it keeps containing the moving particle. 
And the beautiful thing, which is not obvious, is if you follow this rule exactly, then the set sequence of sets ST you get is exactly the dupe transform of the original process. In other words, it's exactly the sequence ST conditioned to be absorbed in the whole space rather than at the empty set. So it's... Um, now, Derkonis and Phil didn't actually consider the Martingale ST. They considered just the, um, just directly this dupe transform. So they found this coupling, which is beautiful, but they didn't have the Martingale to work with. So it turns out that advantageous both to have their coupling and to have the Martingale and kind of use both uh, whenever convenient. Um, okay, so, so one nice property of the evolving, of the volume biased evolving set process, this dupe transform, is, which you see from the coupling, is that at any time, if I look at this ST, the volume biased ESP, <laughs> and I sample a point there uniformly, or more precisely proportional to the degrees, that point has the right distribution, the distribution of the random walk. So um, if I'm not running the coupling, but I'm just looking at the sequence uh, of sets, I can reproduce a particle with the right distribution at any time just by sampling from the stationary distribution conditioned on the, uh, on the current set. And in particular, when this volume biased ESP does get absorbed in the whole space, we get a strong stationary time. So, um, so in other words, if, we, <laughs> if we're going to run, because as I said, at any time, conditional on the set, the location of the particle in the set is conditionally stationary in the set. So once the set is absorbed in the whole space, my particle is stationary in the whole space. So if I run this coupling, if I run the particle with the set together, um, I get a strong stationary time. And they can still use this property, actually in one-dimensional chains, to analyze uh, their mixing. <coughs> and uh, there, are, again, because of the dupe transform, it's easy to convert expectations from the evolving set process to the biased evolving set process. So I'm not going to continue this. So this, this is a, you know, some still pictures of the volume biased ESP. So you see it's growing, and here it's almost evolved in the whole set. And indeed, the movie I showed you before was of the volume biased ESP. If I would have shown you the ESP itself, it would just vanish right away. You wouldn't see anything. So uh, that's really the object, object to look at. So then. I'm not going to go into the analysis of the algorithm. That's really not uh, the point here. But again, this, this paper is, uh, is available. And maybe I just want to emphasize one, so there, one point. The reason the algorithm turns out to be efficient is that at any moment, in order to uh, move, I want to compare it to the natural algorithm of just computing the transition matrix. If I keep multiplying by a large matrix every time, then even entries that don't change very much, I have to compute. But here, this evolving set process, I know that the only changes are happening are at the boundary. Everything that's not on the boundary of the set cannot change. If it's on the outside, it stays on the outside. If it's inside, it stays inside. The only changes happen on the boundary vertices. Now, if the boundary is very small, then I don't have to do a lot of work. If the boundary is very large, then it turns out that the evolving set process is moving very quickly. So it moves quickly out of the locations where I have to do a lot of work. And um, so the algorithm is basically run this process for as long as your budget allows and look at the best conductance that you got along the way. And amazingly, this is uh, still the best algorithm we know to get a good cut. Uh, Trevisan and Oves Garan show that if you just run this algorithm multiple times and look at the best sample of those, you get a substantial improvement and they've quantified how much that, that is better. So, um, so next I want to, so instead of discussing the algorithm more, I want to tell you some of the underlying math. 
So to do that, um, one thing we'll, we'll use is, is a martingale estimate. So I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Maybe let me say where we're headed. So, so, so here is the bound. Uh, a bound that's proved using using evolving sets, so bound for lazy chains, and I'll write it and explain it. So we want to bound the mixing time, and we can bound it using a uh, conductance function. So I'll write so this I there's an integral from the minimum stationary probability to some number um, okay, 4 over epsilon. I'll explain what this is in a moment. OK, so what is? Uh, what is this number phi of u? It's the minimum over all sets, um, over all sets S, so that the um, measure of S is at most U. And what do I minimize? I minimize the boundary to volume ratio. So I look at the edge boundary of S, compute its volume, and compare to the volume of S. So what is the volume of the edge boundary? For every particular edge, the right volume to associate with the edge is the stationary measure of the edge, which is just, if this is an edge connecting two vertices x, y, then the volume is going to be pi x, p x, y. So this is, I'll write this as pi tilde of, of the edge E. This is the edge E connecting x and y. And then given a set S, I look at all the edges that connect S and S complement and measure the total volume of that edge set. So this ratio is really what we want to look at. It's boundary to volume ratio. If pi is just uniform, then this really counts the number of edges on the boundary compared to the number of vertices in S uh, multiplied by the degree. So in the denominator. So OK, so I'm going to focus on the reversible case, but uh, with more care, everything works. So in the paper with Ben Morris, it's written for general chains. But I'm just going to focus on random walks on graphs. So then pi is just proportional to degree. <laughs> OK, so, so one, one case is, so if you go to the case of uh, Chigger inequality that, uh, that uh, Elchanan was talking about, then in that case, phi, so what, uh, right, so this is phi of u, let me emphasize, we do this for u, which is less than a half, and for, for u, which is bigger than a half, we're go just going to define phi of u to be phi of a half. So when the set is very large, um, then, you know, the boundary could be small, uh, and we want to do this trunc kind of truncation. So with, with this formula, that integral is true. Now, suppose the case of Chigger inequality is the case that phi is, um, is the case that phi is uh, constant. So phi is bounded below, okay, then what you get here is a bound okay then the kind of bound that you get here will be a, a constant times log um, times a log of n over epsilon so if you have a case of in the case when you have a Chigger inequality when the conductance is bound, all these phi of u's are bounded below. By a constant, you have an expander graph. 
In that case, the relaxation time is order one, and the mixing time is, you know, is, is order log n, and uh, there's also some dependence on epsilon, and this captures it. This is what you'll get, where n is the, just the number of vertices in the graph, because pi min is going to be certainly at least one over n squared in for, s for any random walk on a graph. But the point of this inequality is that it works also when phi is not a constant, but when phi decreases as, as the set uh, u grows. Now, I should say that in the form I'm writing it here, with worse constant, this type of inequality was first proved by Lovas and Kanan using a very different method. And uh, with Ben, we have an improvement where this is true not just for the mixing time and total variation, but also in L infinity. So T mix epsilon, we define it, you get close in total variation to, um, to the mixing, to the stationary distribution. But this is also true with the L infinity distance where you want to be close pointwise. So you want PTXY over pi Y minus one to be less than epsilon. Right, so the so the first t, so that this holds for all x, y, is this uh, t mix infinity of epsilon. So it's distance in L infinity because there's for all x, y. And if this holds, then it implies the total variation bound uh, by an averaging. But so this is stronger than the total variation bound. <laughs> Uh, the same type of bounds were already known in infinite graphs. So in infinite graphs, instead of bounding the mixing time, you want to bound the transition probabilities and show. So in infinite graphs, a bound like this was proved by uh, Varopoulos and Coulomb, and the kind of bound was, um, <laughs> it says that if the time is bigger than this, then the probability to the transition probabilities are uh, bounded by epsilon. That's the type of bound you have in infinite sets. So Percy, you missed the description of the diaconis field coupling, but uh, you know that one already. <laughs> so that's, that's fine. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, now there's another interesting case I won't prove the, ge the general bound. You can see it in the paper. Let's see, move this up a better way. No. But I want to illustrate the simplest. So there are two simple extreme cases of this. One is when you have an expander, so phi of u is a constant. Another, when you have, say, a regular graph with no further assumptions. So you have a regular connected graph. What could you say then? So suppose you have G as a deregular connected graph. And there are two interesting cases here. One is G infinite. In that case, you want to show that the transition probabilities are always bounded by some constant, can depend on, it depends on degree, divided by by root t. This should be true for all t, x, and y. And for g finite, and you show this p, t, x, y, for g finite, say with, uh, with n vertices, then you want to show that PTXY minus 1 over N can be bounded in the same way. So constant over root T is the behavior we have on when we're walking on Z or, on, um, or in a finite cycle. And, and that's kind of the slowest possible decay. So, And this is a special case of this theorem because in any graph, what can you say? So let me look, for instance, in the, okay, in the finite case. 
So if you, so you take u which is less than, less than half. <coughs> so if you have a set S where its size is less than n over 2. Well, its boundary, it's certainly at least 1 because the graph is connected. So you just plug these two things in, you get a lower bound for phi. And, and if you integrate, and not, then you'll get these two, uh, you'll get these kind of bounds. It may be easiest to see in the infinite case, but these bounds follow from that theorem in this case. Instead of deriving it that way, what I want to do is explain directly how these bounds follow from the evolving set process using a Morningale lemma. <laughs> uh, before I do that, I want to, so that will take a little bit of work. And I should say that these type of bounds are known by other methods uh, that Percy was referring to by uh, Nash inequalities. And um, so these type of isoperimetric bounds, especially in the infinite case, have a, uh, have a long history. <laughs> Um, before going into that, I want to tell you a cute proof I just learned a few weeks ago. So this is a this is a warm up. Uh, so here is a a very nice sub but suboptimal argument due to uh, Tom Hutchcroft. who gave a very Simple algorithm, simple reason why. So let's look at G infinite, but you can do this also in the finite case. So G infinite, why is PT, so here's something weaker. PTXY is, is little o of T to the minus one third. So, so here's a very cute, simple argument for this. So in fact, here's something stronger. Sum over t from 1 to infinity of pt xy cubed is finite. Now pt xy is a sequence which is essentially decreasing. Uh, so let me put here pt xx. So, in order to control PTXY, it's enough to control the diagonal. So I'm going to look at the diagonal. So if I look at PTXX, this is a decreasing sequence if I go along even times. It's enough to consider even times. And if I have any sequence which is summable and decreasing, then right, if you have a sequence a, AN so that AN is summable and AN is decreasing, then a n must be little o of 1 over n. So that's a little calculus exercise. So we just apply that for the, the even times, and we get that this implies this. But why is this true? Why is the sum of third powers of PTXX finite? This is for any infinite graph, any, any infinite connected graph. So here's the, here's the reason. It's, very cool if you haven't seen it. So the reason is that an infinite connected graph necessarily contains an infinite path. In other words, G contains, as a subgraph, a copy of the integers. So this implies that if I look at, suppose I look at G cubed. And I'm going to, there are two ways to take, I'm going to take G cubed, is, this is the diagonal product. So a neighbor of a point x, y, z is a point x prime, y prime, z prime, where x is a neighbor of x prime, and so on. So G cubed is going to contain a copy of n cubed. Again, but this is, a na this is kind of with diagonal connections. So any point is connected to any other point where all the distance is 1 in all three coordinates. But the point is, Z, you know that three-dimensional lattice, z cubed, is transient. And this is also true for n cubed, and it doesn't matter which form of cube you take. This is standard that all these forms are equivalent. So this is a transient graph. 
n cubed is a transient graph. So transients, there's a Rayleigh monotonicity principle based on electrical networks, where the technion after all, that says that if uh, one graph contains another and the small graph is transient, then so is the big graph because there is a way to send electrical flow to infinity in the small graph, so it's also true in the big graph. So G cubed must be transient as well, but that means that the, what the, in a transient graph, the probabilities of returning to a starting point must be summable. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the equivalent conditions to transients. But this sum is exactly this sum. Okay? So you get for free a bound of t to the minus one third, which is not optimal, but uh, it's uh, really with very little work. Okay, so let's see how we can understand the sharper bound. So we have a general slogan that we use is, uh, you know, we model the world with Markov chains and we analyze it with martingales. And this is uh, an example of that. So, so here's a little martingale lemma that I'm going to quickly go through. Let's see. And there are various constants, but the takeaway message is that if you have a martingale where the, where the it can't go too wild, and the, on the other hand, the variance of every step is bounded below, then the probability the martingale stays positive is like for a simple random walk, namely constant over square root of the time. So let's start from the conclusion, then go back to the hypothesis. The conclusion is that the probability the martingale stays positive for all times up to k is bounded by a constant over root k. Okay, now what are the constants? So let's assume we start at one, or it doesn't matter if we start at any constant height. Let's assume this martingale can't become negative, and that the variance is bounded below by some sigma squared, except we're going to have the martingale absorb the zero, because that's what is going to be the case for our examples. And we assume that it can't, um, these second moments can't become too wild, so this is some, so if, so we're going to run the martingale until the first time it either reaches zero or exceeds height h. And we're also going to stop at time k. And we have an assumption that at this stopping time, the, we haven't jumped too far high. So this second moment is at most uh, constant h squared. So this is just some weak regularity assumption. And then you get a lower bound. And the important thing, the probability is bounded by constant over root k. If we so this is very standard for simple random walk, and it's true for any martingale under these <coughs> conditions. And maybe in view of time, the proof is a standard game with optional stopping. So in the interest of, which takes two pages, in the interest of time, I will um, maybe, maybe skip it. And just, so this can be used in several places. Let me show you how it, it's used to bound transition probabilities. And for simplicity, I'll focus on regular graphs, but with this works more generally. So we want to prove a bound like this. Ptxy is bounded by constant over root t. So we call this evolving set process, which uh, in the regular case, you can write this parameter of p of a y is the number of x in a, which are neighbors of y divided by d. So this is the fraction of the neighbors of y that are in A. And that's going to be the probability that we jump from y to A. And this is the evolving set process. We start at a point, and at any time t plus 1, we take this point y, where this ratio is bigger than ut plus 1, where u's are independent uniform variables. So what's the connection of this to the random walk? Because of the regularity, we don't have any correction here. Ptxy is just the probability that y is in st. And this is easy to check by induction. So pt plus 1 of xy, the probability to go in t plus 1 steps. We just write the usual forward equation, the sum, sum over z of the probability to go in t steps from x to z times pzy. Now, 
by the induction hypothesis, we can write PTXZ as the probability that Z is in ST, which I prefer to write as expectation of an indicator. And now once we write it as an expectation of an indicator, we can take the expectation outside. We have this form. And then we observe that this sum is just the sum over all Z and ST of P of ZY. That's just what's written here. But this sum is just the probability you know, we had this formula P of A Y, the fraction of neighbors of Y that are in A. So this is just the, the fraction of neighbors of Y in ST, which is, um, which is by definition the probability that Y will be in ST plus one in the next step. So it just follows by induction from the definition. So we. So the definition of ST plus one implies that this probability is the expected expectation of the conditional probability. So, so this, this gives the identity we want. And the other fact I already mentioned, the volume of ST is a martingale here because I'm taking a regular graph, then I can just look at the cardinality and the expected size after one step, again, it's, and we just write it as the sum of the expectations. This, this probability is just the ratio of how many neighbors of Y are in ST, and, and then we can rewrite it in this form. So um, I'm going a little fast in view of the time, but I just want to say this is, once you decode the definition, this is very elementary to verify the Martingale property. And then we want to use all that to get, to put these together to get this kind of bound for the transition probability. So we just use the martingale, which is the size of the evolving set, and it satisfies the assumptions of the lemma. So we'll check that in a moment. The evolving set can't grow by too much in every step because my graph is deregular. And uh, let's check the variance condition. So we want to check that the variance of the set given the previous set is not too small. And <coughs> so one formula for the variance of a random variable is you just take half the expectation of two independent copies. So we take ST plus one, I mean the half the difference in the second moment of two independent copies. So ST plus one and ST plus one tilde are two independent copies and they differ by at least, at least one over D because um, the set ST has you know, an edge out and we might either add that or not add that. So it's easy to see that we have some variability in the size of ST plus one. There's always a vertex Y which is connected both to ST and ST complement and, and we have uncertainty whether that vertex is going to be included in the next step. So using this lower bound on the variance and the general Martingale lemma gives this, if you chase the constant, it gives this estimate. And I've talked about infinite graphs, but essentially the same argument will give an upper bound on the distance to stationarity. So in any graph, PTXY minus pi Y is bounded by a constant over root T for bounded degree graphs. And it, it follows from uh, similar ideas. So PTXY minus pi Y, write it as probability. So PTXY in the regular case is probability that Y is in ST. Now pi of Y is exactly the probability that the process at will be absorbed in the whole set. So remember the process in the finite case will definitely get absorbed either in the empty set or in the whole space. The probability it will be absorbed in the whole space is exactly pi of the starting point given, um, <coughs> and here I'm working in the regular case so all points have the same value of pi. And that's because of Martingale optional stopping. The expected value of the volume at the end must be equal to the expected value of the volume at the beginning, but the expected volume value of the volume at the end is just the probability of being absorbed in the whole space. So 
<laughs> so it's this form, and then uh, this difference is just bounded by the probability that the set is uh, still not absorbed. So it's between zero, between its size is between zero and the full and the full volume. So. Um, right, because the left-hand event indicates that the set is not empty, and we're subtracting the probability of being absorbed in the whole space. So this is bounded by the event here. And, and now one can apply the lemma to bound the probability of this event, and so you bound the difference. Okay, so... Maybe that's what I wanted to say about this. You can find the proof of the general mixing time bound in the paper. And now, at least, let me go back to the... So, so I'm just finishing with the movie you saw in the beginning. So now you know more what, uh, what this process is you're seeing. So this is exactly the... Um, the dupe transform of the evolving set process, or equivalently, it's showing the uh, evolving set part in the diaconis fill coupling I told you about in the beginning. And it the what? So the, right, it's transformed to be absorbed in the whole space rather than, and so, <coughs> right, so it's the same as when you run the couple, the coupling, the set together with the point and condition the set to contain the point, um, you get the same process. And so you, <coughs> so you see it sometimes grows, sometimes shrinks, but when it's small, it doesn't tend to shrink because it's conditioned not to absorb in, in zero. When it's, and you can kind of see that at any time, it sort of tends to have a s relatively small boundary compared to sets of that size. Okay, thanks for your attention.